encountering Jesus in the greatest prophetic song. The purpose of this study is to reveal the pattern of John 17, 26. And I'll just typically refer to it as John 17, 26, and that's a passage you just have to get used to if you're new here. So the purpose of this particular course, this particular uh, avenue of study that we're taking is to give the progression, the principles involved in growing into this love wherein the Father loves His Son being imparted to people. In the song, the Holy Spirit records the principles necessary in the progression involved in growing into full passion for Jesus. It is a progression. I want to say that strongly. This book sets forth a divine pattern of growing. There's, it is a perfect pattern given by the Holy Spirit. It cannot be improved upon. I say that strongly. My interpretation can. Your interpretation can. But this is the love song of the ages. As far as, my, as, far as I understand it. And I, I believe it cannot be improved upon. The pattern. It is a perfect transcript of God's soul. As to the pattern of maturity and progress into passion. It sets forth principles of spiritual maturity. It helps us to understand our progress with clarity. A devotional study of this book will enlarge your heart in love. Say it again, the purpose of the study is to reveal the pattern of John 17, 26, which is the great prayer of Jesus. The song reveals the pattern. It touches all the significant themes within the whole counsel of God necessary to grow in passion for Jesus, necessary for the first commandment. All the major principles necessary are set forth. I'm giving you a vision for the song is what I'm doing. The order, the sequence is magnificent. The longer I study it, the more I'm convinced of the magnificence and the beauty of this book, line upon line, is this, I've studied hard for now 10 years, which is, by the way, studying a book, that's a very short amount of time to be dedicated to a book. You know, I've been enjoying a book I've been talking about publicly by Alex Mateer. He has spent 35 years devoted to Isaiah. Now, that's a serious devotion to a book. So it's not, uh, I'm not uh, qualified at this point in time at the 10-year mark to talk about devoting a life to a book, but I believe that in 20 or 30 years, Lord willing, I'll be able to say that. But in these short 10 years, I am convinced I see it more clear all the time. I go, Lord. And I imagine him saying something like, you don't even begin to know what's hidden in these phrases. Understanding is a fountain of life. And what happens is that you will locate where you are in this book. You'll say, oh, that's what's happening to me. Oh, I get it. You will find yourself in the book. Now, Sometimes you'll find yourself in the same hour in two places in the book. And you'll visit several places in the book a number of times throughout your life. So don't think that you have to be at one place at one time and once you're there, you'll never visit there again. It doesn't work that way. I find myself at two places in the same hour. And then I find myself revisiting a a place I've been before in the book, but in a different way, in a different application. Okay. Okay. May you open your heart, the secret places of your heart, to the deep searchings of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my prayer is that you would open your heart and the Spirit would search your heart deep and show you things. That you might grow up into Him who is the head. This will require, here's a key phrase, long and loving meditation on this portion of Scripture called the Song of Songs. Beloved, I want to challenge you, I want to call you to a life of long and loving meditation upon this book. My prayer is that a number of you will make this, not only your met, not only receive it as a mandate from heaven, you can't make that, but receive it if the Lord's mandated it, but you would make it a holy recreation. It would, you would make it one of your favorite hobbies in life, discovering splendor in different facets of the fragrance of God in this book. Again, it's a struggle on the front end, but only after, only for a while, and then it connects. Then it begins to flow like a river. Okay. Encountering Jesus. Journaling and prayer reading. How to, how to pray read the Scripture. How to journal it or how to pray read the Scripture. 
the following as a practical aid to help you give your heart, to give our hearts to God, to receive from Him. The purpose of this section of notes is to show you how to use the love song as a springboard of inspiration for your heart. The backside of each page, uh, we're purposefully leaving blank as we're putting this in, uh, going to make this into a, bind it into a book so that people can journal as they pray read the love song. As you read through it, pray back the actual Bible passages back to, the, back to God. I cannot emphasize this enough. Write down what the Lord's putting on your heart. I define two broad categories of truth related to meditation. First, truths that exhort us to believe God's Word. Second category of truth related to meditation are truths that exhort us to obey God's Word. I just have two broad divisions in the Scripture when related to the subject of meditation of the Scripture. Truths that exhort us to believe God's Word. Basically, I do two things with that. And I'm just going to mention it and then let you read it more on your own. There's a scripture that God calls us to believe. What we do is, first thing we do, number one, is we thank Him for the scripture. We thank Him for the truth. The Lord says, you've ravished, I have ra- uh, you have ravished my heart. Now that's a truth that God's wanting you to believe. You have ravished my heart, the, the, Jesus is speaking to His church. The first thing we do is we thank Him for it. I talk about how the Holy Spirit will tenderize us as we give simple declarations of thank you, I have ravished your heart. Turn that into a declaration, a statement, a dialogue back of thanksgiving. That simple little exercise will tenderize your spirit. The number two, take it to the next uh, step. Ask him to release the spirit of revelation, to, to reveal it. Father, show me the truth of how I've ravished your son's heart. Jesus, let the spirit of revelation open this to them. Ask God to write it on your heart and to show you what it means. Okay, truths exhorting us to obey God's word. See, the first category exhorts us to believe. The next category exhorts us to obey. To believe, we thank him and we ask him to reveal it. The word, the truths exhorting us to obey God's word, number one, commit yourself to the Lord in in that passage. If there's a certain passage of scripture, like one that I'm uh, taking here is where she was to be committed. She was to go to the mountain of Myrn. We'll talk about that quite a few times through it. That was a, a place of sacrifice, a place of costly risk. When, though you don't have to use that symbolism, but we take passages, we commit ourselves. Lord Jesus, I make it the intention of my heart to obey you in this uh, clear, direct statements of intention to obey. We answer the scripture with these prayerful, devotional statements of intention to obey. And then number two, we ask Jesus to empower our, our hearts to obey a particular truth. Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, empower me to ascend the mountain of myrrh or to obey any particular uh, uh, exhortation the Holy Spirit's giving you. Take time to record your thoughts, your meditations as you pray read. The simple exercise of writing your ideas will help you take this magnificent song and turn it into prayer dialogue. And I, I want to say something that, I, that I, I, I don't have time to say it time after time after time, but I should. This song must be turned into prayerful dialogue and meditation in order to get the full benefit out of it. What some believers will do is they will come to the class, learn the terminology, get a a, a little momentary uh, inspiration out of it, remember that they liked it, underline it in their Bible, talk about Song of Solomon to their friends and how it changed their life when they took that course, and never ever turn the thing into the, in, in the language of it, never gets into their prayer life, their prayer language with God in the privacy of their heart. And it will not do anything but be a memory of how it wooed you way back when, when you took it in a course in the training center. And I've seen that time after time again. The power of this book is not to feel wild and wooed by reading a commentary or hearing a teaching on it and then go and then have the memory that you were wowed and wooed this book the learning of it is to equip you to get prayer language that actually gets into your living relationship with God that when you're driving down the road the phrases 
the few phrases, the 5, 10, 15, 20, it might grow to 30, little phrases that emanate out of your spirit to God in your private time when you come and where you go and God the Spirit takes it and changes your heart in that position, in that place. Learning it with your mind and the concepts will only change you if it gets into your prayer language, into your dialogue with God. And, and I feel energy about this because I feel this desperate kind of feeling that people become connoisseurs of sermons and connoisseurs of the Song of Solomon, but they never ever drink the wine in a personal way and that touches their heart. My concern is that some of you will only study it without going to the next step of turning it into prayer for dialogue. It's much more than an intellectual exercise. It's like going to a restaurant I have here, a, f- a famous restaurant, a fine restaurant, a, the most brilliant menu, and looking at it and going, I've memorized it, I've, I've seen this menu. I've studied it. I have a picture of it on my wall at home. I, I carry it in my wallet. I, I can quote it to you. But have you eaten the food at the restaurant? Well, no. I, I mean, I have really learned the menu. You have to tr- this has to become a meal that's, that feeds your spirit, and I mean that, really. To be a connoisseur of the Song of Solomon with a memory of being wowed by it a few years ago will never, ever change your life. A couple years from now, when you look back on this class, okay, I've made that point, but not near strong enough. I beg thee, take that point serious. What what I did, I'll tell you just a little thing I did, is I got the maybe 20 key phrases that were key to me, not necessarily key to you, every one, that were prayer phrases. I put them in a postcard, a couple postcards, put them in my car, just one-liners, and I drive down the road, I take my postcard out, and I would just take one prayer one or two of them, whatever. Obviously, you learn them like super well. I went 15 or 20 of them. And over a few months, I did this some time ago, and just, and just began to get them all into my spirit. Just when I'd be alone, I would just pray them. Then I'd come and go. Just, just in everyday life, I would just say those phrases to the Lord as I would walk. I would just say them in a prayerful, not a memorized mode. I'm not in a memory mode. I'm in a prayer reaching in my heart to God mode. And of course, one of the famous ones is, oh, Father, let him kiss me. Just that phrase. I just say, oh, let him kiss me. Now, one of my favorite ones is in 2.5, sustain me, refresh me. He's talking about unfolding this romance to your heart. Oh, sustain me and refresh me. Sustain me. There, there's lots of one-liners. Just go find them yourself. There's a number of prayers. And, and I might, uh, actually, I, I, I have a list. But I don't have it in handout form yet. But uh, we're thinking about doing that and, and making it available. But I think it's better if you go find it yourself and personalize it. Because it's only an eight-chapter love song. You can find it quite easy. The eight revelations of Jesus in the song. Oh, this is, I love this. But I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one. Jesus reveals eight different facets of his personality in the song. Each one reveals a unique aspect of his relationship with the bride. What I'm going to do is combine four names of God in Isaiah with the four faces of that God reveals His beauty through the seraphim and the cherubim. So I'm going to skip those and just kind of summarize it to you. The four faces in the Isaiah, wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, and everlasting father. Counselor, God, prince of peace, father. Those are the faces that Jesus reveals of the beauty of God. The four faces of the cherubim and the seraphim, there's a little difference between them, but they each have the same four faces is the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. And those four faces in Isaiah, and those four faces of the living creatures around the throne, correspond with the eight faces that Jesus shows in the Song of Solomon. And I have that laid out in the next couple pages, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. I just want you to know it's there. Oh, it's fantastic. It really is. That's, I think that you, there's a lifetime study in the four faces of the four living creatures with those four titles of Isaiah, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, and Everlasting Father. Those going together in Song of Solomon, that will be a meal that will satisfy your heart. Okay. The greatest prophetic song. I want to speak not only but primarily to the uh, worship community. Not only because it's, it's more than a, a, uh, something for the worship community that lead in worship is what I mean. We're all a worshiping community. 
The first verse, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon. The phrase, the Song of Songs. What a sentence. What a title by the Holy Spirit. Solomon wrote a thousand and five songs. He was a very prolific and gifted songwriter. This is his very best song. It's referred to it as the Song of All Songs. This expresses the superlative. In the same way that Jesus is called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, He dwells in the Holy of Holies, in the Heaven of Heavens, it says in the book of Daniel. These biblical phrases express superlative. That's the point. The highest of the high is the idea. B, when Solomon describes this song as the Song of Songs, it conveys in the Hebrew the highest of the highest. There is no song higher. The Spirit of God has called it the Song of All Songs. The Spirit of God has titled this, not Solomon. Solomon might have been used, some say others, uh, later on in church history titled it. But when it found its place in the canon of Scripture, we understand the Holy Spirit is the author, the inspiration of that title. The song is penned with highest honor. I believe it's the greatest song ever penned by the redeemed in all of redeemed history. There are 23 songs or prayers in Revelation. At least 10 of them are considered songs. In the book of Revelation. Some of the songs and prayers, it's hard to know which are which. I call them the top ten of heaven, those songs in the book of Revelation. And you could make it 11 or 12, depending on if you consider one a song or two, but that's not the point. I call it the top ten. My theory is that John only gave the titles of the songs that are sang in heaven. It is possible, and I believe probable, that the songs themselves are probably quite lengthy songs filled with the glory of God. We only get the title, Glory and Honor Belong to Him. The Spirit of God drops down into the spirit of His people little fragments of eternal songs that are currently being enjoyed in heaven. I really believe that the Spirit of God takes out of that great treasury of music in the heart of God and He drops a little sliver of it into a singer. A songwriter, and they write a song, and, it's, and it, it blesses and refreshes and cleanses the body of Christ. The song we just heard. It's a little, there's, there's the, that's a little sliver out of a big song in heaven. Mark my word, that song is going on in heaven. It's a little sliver, and you might get a few more slivers out of that one. The Lord has blessed us with, with uh, Holy Spirit songwriters that touch the bridal theme. Chris Dupre and Joanne and Julie and David Roos. Some of you know him, was here for some years. He touches this theme quite often, and oh, it's fantastic. Your spirit resonates when those, a few of the drops of those songs that are being enjoyed in heaven are dropped into the spirit of a songwriter, and he or she sings it under the anointing of the Spirit. Laura Hackett, a little 15-year-old or whatever young girl sang the song out of Song of Solomon 8 Sunday morning. I went, oh, wow. Two Sundays ago, I said, I asked her father. She said, she just wrote it. You've been studying it. I said, oh, this is going to get good. This is really going to get good. If that's happening already, it's going to get good. I believe the greatest song of all songs surpasses even these songs highlighted in the book of Revelation. I believe the song of all songs eclipses every song, even the top ten. If you'll allow me that uh, liberty of calling it that. The songs in the book of Revelation are just hints. It's a key pointer. They're just hints pointing to full meanings, the fuller meanings of songs in heaven. I believe this eight-chapter love song, they're only hints to vast realities in the heart of God in heaven. They're only hints. There's so much meaning to every phrase. The purpose of the prophetic song is to reveal the fresh heart of Jesus. These songs speak of the beauty of The splendor of his personality. John the Apostle said the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Well, actually, John recorded it. An angel told that to John. He says, John, he says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. The two of them are combined, which, did you know that Jesus has a testimony? What do I mean by his testimony? It's the fresh thing that's on his heart. Now, it's centered on the cross, But his testimony includes what he thinks and feels about past, present, and future events. These all come together in the eternal eternal present tense in God. Jesus has a testimony. He has feelings about things past, present, and future. Of course, it's centered on the cross, but his testimony is made known through the prophetic spirit. It's what he's feeling and thinking that are powerfully a part of his heart. 
The prophetic spirit touches that testimony, little parts of it, and reveals it under the power of God to the church. That's a prophetic spirit resting on preachers and intercessors and singers and writers. A prophetic spirit touching a little bit of that fresh impulse of God's heart. The end time saints are pictured as standing around the throne of God on a sea of glass like crystal. And they're pictured singing two songs. Revelation 15, verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 describes they're on the sea of glass like crystal, mingled with flaming fire, harps in their hands, and they're singing two songs, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. The song of Moses is recorded in the Bible. Now, they came off victorious, it says, in verse 2. They were martyred, but these singers were victorious, which means they had undying love that held true even in the face of martyrdom. It says these are the ones that came off victorious from the beast, but they were martyred, but they were victorious. Their love was, was strong to the end, so therefore they're victorious. They're on the sea of glass, filled with the fire of God, singing two songs on the last day. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, is on this sea of glass like crystal with fire inspiring, empowering the saints to worship extravagantly these two songs. Their worshiping is mingled with flaming fire. And on and on. It's, it's a vast subject. Well, Moses has a song, but the Lamb of God has a song too. It's called the Lamb's Song. Did you know Jesus has a song that the Scripture calls, the Holy Spirit calls it the Lamb's Song, the song of the Lamb, the song that belongs uniquely to the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. His name is the Word of God. He says, I am the Word of God. And I believe that the one who is called the Word of God has his song is somewhere in the Word of God. That's my personal theory. And I, I developed that point through, through the next number of paragraphs. I believe that song. I'll just summarize these next paragraphs. I believe that song. I believe it. It's my opinion. I can't prove it. I believe the Lamb's song is the song of all songs. I believe the Lamb's song is the greatest one. It's the song of all songs. It's the greatest song. I can't imagine the song of all songs, the number one, and then the Lamb song being number two. I just can't fathom that. Jesus, that was really an excellent song. It's second to the song of all songs. It's my own personal opinion, but I expect to be fully compensated for it in heaven. When I stand before the Lord, he'll say, you know what? I gave you that, but I reward you when I give you free things and you take them. Now, that's, that's an excellent exchange rate, isn't it? When you take the free gifts and run with them, you get rewarded in gold that lasts forever. It's a free gift, but I'm running with it. And I, and I imagine the Lord will say, I want you to stand for who I am and what I'm doing. It's a theory, but I believe it. Jesus sings many different songs over his church, not just the one song. He sings many of them through his people, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to his Father, there's a statement in the book of Hebrews where it's quoted from Psalm 22 where Jesus, the, uh, the, the psalmist David is, is overhearing a conversation between the Father and the Son, the spirit of it. And the Father, is, is Jesus is speaking to the Father, he says, Father, I'm going to declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing to you. Jesus says, when the church gathers... And all the congregation, I am going to sing to you, Father, in their midst. Now, that's an interesting statement. How is it that he sings to us? Firstly, he sings directly to his brethren. He's singing directly to the saints. He's singing of the praise of God, the heart of God. And he's singing in the midst of the congregation. It's coming forth through the body of Christ. When prophetic anointed singers sing the song of the Lord, Jesus describes it as him singing to the Father in the midst of his church and singing to the brethren as well. No, he's singing to the brethren about the Father is what he's doing. How does he do it? I believe he does it through prophetic songs. Some of them are spontaneous. They just are there for that moment. Some of them are written down. The Lord gives them ahead of time, but they're still prophetic songs. The fact that a song is recorded and written and known ahead of time, it's still a prophetic song. If it was a God-breathed song that's revealing the testimony of Jesus, the fresh heart of God. 
the Son of God has many songs he sings in the midst of the congregation. But I believe there is one song he enjoys above every other song. It's the song of all songs. I believe he says, now that song I want to sing to my brethren. Oh, I want to praise you, Father. I want to sing. There's one song, and I believe that he is going to pull little slivers of truth out of the great song of all the ages, and he's going to begin to sing it through individual prophetic singers. Again, some spontaneous, some written. Okay. Jesus washes his bride with the word of God. That's what he says. That's what Paul the Apostle says. Jesus washes his bride with the word of God. He sanctifies and cleanses by washing her with the word. And I believe he's going to wash the church with the word of God in song. Jesus' primary agent of cleansing his bride is the scripture. His primary agent of washing and sanctifying is by the water of the word through the scripture. But he describes himself as singing it over his people. To the Father. He's singing it to the brethren and he's singing it to the Father. It's both directions. How much more will Jesus use the song of all songs to romance his people at the end of the age? I really believe that this, I don't believe it's just a uh, uh, kind of a heightened imagination of mine. I believe this is the Holy Spirit preparing people to begin to connect with this message. That's why I'm spending so much time on it. I believe there's going to be a multitude of new songs written in our day that will capture the unique themes of the Song of Solomon. Multitudes. I believe multitudes in all languages this song is going to open up. My prayer is that there's going to be a revival of interest to the Song of Solomon in the last generation. I believe the Holy Spirit's going to make it prominent again. Do you know the Song of Songs was a very prominent book in the medieval centuries? In the Middle Ages, it's a very, very prominent book in, church, in, in the church. It's kind of lost. It's kind of been relegated and uh, placed on the back shelf in the last hundred or two hundred, last couple hundred years. But I believe the Holy Spirit's going to raise it up again and men and women, old and young, will sing it, write it, intercede it, proclaim it. I'm going to pray these truths until God looses a Holy Spirit revival. Again, we're witnessing already a significant increase of new bridal songs out of this. You're, you're running into them everywhere. I travel quite a bit. And just, just because I'm very sensitive to this subject, I'll go to a place I've never been before. They're, they're singing their own worship songs. And the language of the Song of Solomon is just, is just breaking out everywhere in worship songs. I'm on the front row and I'm going, oh, good, it's getting good. It's getting better. I like it. And just folks all over the lands and different countries are capturing it. I'm finding it in the worship language in the last two or three years significantly, but it's going to increase far more than it has in the last couple of years, which has been unprecedented. Now, I'm going to give uh, practical advice to singers. Well, I mean, I mean to songwriters. I believe it is not the best to merely sing the exact phrases of the song. Rather, it's better to interpret them and then sing them. Some of the exact phrases of the song are difficult for the, for the folks in the body that are not equipped in the language of the song to understand it. You can talk about, and, uh, as, a, as a main thing, uh, ascending the, the mount to the hill of frankincense. They'll go like, and we'll ascend the hill of frankincense, I guess. You know, I don't know. You know, I never... It's okay to put some of the phrases. That's not my point. My point is, is that I believe it's best to understand them and interpret them in the language of the song, and you can capture, capture the phrase. It's okay to put the language here and there, but it must be interpreted in the song itself somehow, and that you'll only be able to take a little bit of the Song of Solomon per new song you write. I, I've met some folks that are trying to take large chunks, large sections of the Song of Solomon, force it all into one song. I go, that, that's not going to work. The average person doesn't have a clue what you're saying. It, it doesn't edify them. But just take a theme or two and a phrase here or there, interpret it in the other language, you know, in, in your, your normal language, and let the people begin to receive it and to be edified by it. Let's move on. It's the longest, most intense song in the Bible. It is in a dense, concentrated form. It really is. The Song of Solomon is a concentrated, intense, densely packed together form of the passion of God's heart. And again, 
10 or 12 verses in one song could never, I can't imagine that, 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 that uh, uh, most people being able to understand it. But take a phrase, again, use the phrases here and there, but interpret them and only cover a little bit of ground per new song you write. Don't try to cover the whole book. It's way too big. This is the song of all songs. It's far bigger than our capacity to contain it in five or six or eight uh, of, our, of our own songs. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to give you a tip off on, on a theme to, to go deep on and write songs. One phrase in this song can be packed into many ideas. Break it down. One phrase in this song, I mean, can it, can, one phrase in the song can be expanded into so many ideas. It's, it's best to break it down, the larger pieces, into separate little songs. And don't try to cover too much ground in one, in one song. Don't try to cover too many verses. I was at a conference, a large conference in Toronto, at the, uh, uh, you know, the Toronto, you know, the Toronto, <laughs> and anyway, uh, the airport, vineyard, whatever, you know what I mean, and uh, there was lot, thousands of people, and this brother got, came from England, he got up and he said, he was just giving a testimony of how the Lord touched him in his church, and he goes, and how everybody did this and that, and was touched by the Spirit, and there's thousands of people at this conference, and everybody's excited, and he goes, oh, and by the way, he goes, the Lord told me I had to say this, he's going to, I mean, I don't know him, he doesn't know me, there's no relationship in that way, he gets up and he says, the Lord told us, a number of us, very powerful, he is going to cause a revival of the book of Song of Solomon to be put in the center place of the church, God's going to restore it to its place, and release it, oh, I just about died of love, right on the front row, I said, that's good. I like that. This is really good. See, I started off slow. The first, remember, my first uh, response was a little hesitant, but uh, I'm, I'm on board now. Okay. One of my life prayers has been to ask the Lord to, and I've said this for years and years, to those of you who've been around here, to inspire 10,000 preachers, writers, singers, men and women, old and young, to take this message and run with it to the highways and byways. Arise, O singers of the Lord. Preachers, writers, arise and take your place before the Lord. Friends of the bridegroom, the bridegroom's spirit, arise and proclaim and make clear. The Lord's going to raise multitudes, but I've just had the number 10,000 for many years to be able to see them with my own eyes, men and women, writing, singing, bringing the bridegroom message to the highways and byways, filling the earth. You know, the number will be far bigger than 10,000. That's just a number that I'm believing for in prayer for many years. Some of you are sitting in this room, some of you are in this training center from all, from, we have them from 15 different nations and many states. Arise and begin to say yes to the mandate and the call that God has brought you to this place to say yes and to get definition, to get clarity about this calling on your life. Some of you said, I don't know why it was there. And after you get done with this course, you're going to say, some of you, that gave me clarity as to what I knew but I didn't have language for. That is exactly what has been in my spirit from, from uh, even some years back. Okay, let's continue. The unique focus of the book. The unique focus of the book. The general purpose of this book is to fully capture people's hearts by the greatest prophetic song ever. Again, I can't prove without a shadow of a doubt from the Bible this is the greatest prophetic song, except for God calls it the song of all songs. I, I'm operating from that. But I believe it with all of my heart. Here's, I have five distinctives in this book. Five things that make this book unique. And I assume... Important to understand the uniqueness so that you can go drink from the well. You can focus and go after these truths so you don't miss these truths. Number one, it's a condensed revelation of the passionate affections of Jesus' personality. I mean, it's line after line. I love you. I like you. I love you. I like you. I'm in love with you. I'm in love with you. I like you. Wow, when I look at you. That's what he's saying to weak and broken people. Line after line after line after line. I'm for you. And I tell you, if you need that in your life, which every single believer does, the Song of Solomon is the well you want to drink from. Okay. It has insight into the beauty of Jesus. More than just the fact of his affection, his beauty, his, 
his, his uh, multifacets of his beauty, but specifically as a bridegroom king. There's many facets of his beauty beyond that, but it locks into the bridegroom king over and over and over. The third unique distinctive is the beauty and the loveliness of the individual believer, even in their spiritual immaturity. If you want to know what you look like to God, it's line after line, densely concentrated form, Song of Solomon, how lovely you are, how beautiful you are. If you want to know how pretty you really are before God, what you really look like to Him, this is the book. And beloved, the church needs this and all the sexual brokenness. This book is, is what the church needs to touch the core of the sexual brokenness and the emotional woundedness of the whole earth right now. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, there's con- factors compounding the brokenness and the woundedness of the, of the human race on the planet earth right now. The, I mean, the explosion of filth that's being poured into the earth through the internet, the, the, the exaggerated increase of availability of perversion to every home and everywhere in such large amounts of numbers to, you know, folks 5, 6, and 10, 15, 20, and when they're 30 and 40, 10, 15, 20 years from now, God has, I believe, not the only by any means, but He has something in His heart, I believe, He's going to touch the compounding emotional woundedness and sexual brokenness of the planet if they want it. It's, consli- it's, it's a densely concentrated line upon line. I like you. I am beautiful. I will fascinate you. You are beautiful. It will enthrall you to see the truth of who you are. Line upon line after line touching the deepest core of the human spirit. Number four, the beauty of the corporate church through history. Not only who you are as an individual, but who we are together in history and in eternity as a unit, as one body before God, and the magnificent place we have. You can see that in Song of Solomon, though we're not going to aim at that in this particular study. And then the principles that are, number five, that are laid out that relate to growing in the first commandment. Song of Solomon doesn't give you all the ministry skills and all the relationship skills of, that are required in the Great Commission. I mean, it calls us to the Great Commission. It calls us to the Second Commandment. It calls us to everything. But the thing it, it, it focuses on, the uniqueness of the book, is line upon line how to walk in the first commandment. Because if you walk in the first commandment, the second commandment and the Great Commission are inevitable if the first commandment touches you. They're, it's not like we choose one versus the other. The first commandment is the power for the, for the second commandment, the Great Commission, not the alternative to them, it's the power of them. The song does not teach us anything that is not said many other places in the Bible. Everything in the song is said over and over. Here's the, the uniqueness is found in the focus and the concentration of how it's presented here. The uniqueness of the book isn't the fact it says God loves us, it's the focused, concentrated presentation of the love of God. Line after line after line after line. I mean, we can read about the love of God a little here, a little there. We find key statements right through uh, the pages of Scripture. But never, every other line is it just hitting you. It's like a holy laser beam just pounding, uh, breaking the, the, uh, the crustiness and the strongholds of darkness on the heart. It's unrelenting, just hitting us over and over until darkness is broken off of our hearts and our spirit man is liberated to be who we are in our destiny and our spiritual genetics. The uniqueness of the book is not the fact it contains these truths. These truths are everywhere in the Bible. It's the way that it gathers them together in a focused, concentrated way. That's the uniqueness of this book. Don't think you're going to read Song of Solomon and find a truth that isn't elsewhere in the Word. That would be dangerous. And it's the time somebody comes to me and says, I found something here that's nowhere else. I go, you didn't find it there. You're in vain imagination right now. The, the Jesus is the Word of God. He has called the Word of God. He has confirmed His heart right through the pages of the Scripture. I don't expect to find anything unique in the book except for the combination the synergism, the power of all the accumulated, concentrated form of the historic doctrines of Scripture related to the first commandment, the beauty of the Lord. It's the focus that makes the song unique. Our soul comprises many different emotional aspects. Oh, the vast mystery of the human heart. We, we don't even begin to understand the complicated makeup of the human soul. And people devote their lives to it psychology and sociology, 
Christian and secular, and we don't begin to touch the vastness of the core of all that goes to comprising the mystery of the human spirit. We can't understand its beauty, its dignity, its destiny, nor the mystery of how it operates in fullness. There's many, many different aspects, and some of them are hidden. Many of them are hidden. The Word of God works on us in a way that we cannot articulate clearly. We can't find every, we can't uh, break apart every part of, of impact we get from the Word of God to outline it and to dissect it and to categorize it in the way we'd like to because some of the Word of God moves in a hidden way and it transforms us in a way that we cannot categorize and define in a scientific fashion. Our soul comprises many different emotional aspects. Certain aspects of our heart can only be touched through divine poetic romance. Certain aspects of our heart can only be touched, can only be healed, can only be empowered through the prophet, divine prophetic romance. We were created in a way that this poetic, romantic language in, of God's truth, it touches a deep part of us that other parts of God's truth don't touch. Part of our being was created to respond best to this concentrated f- revelation of His passion, line upon line. Okay, God wants to touch the whole heart. Jesus said, you'll love the Lord God with all your heart, with the whole heart. The whole heart is like a diamond that has many angles. It says, it's, the Song of Solomon is, is as if God is shooting a holy laser beam of revelation straight to one facet of the diamond, cutting it and forming it and fashioning it after. It's, it's, a, it's a, a very, very unique ministry of the Holy Spirit. The idea that Jesus has a strong and deep emotions of desire, it seems unrealistic and even impossible to a number of people. They go, oh, come on, you know, we like this, but let's get real about this. The uncreated God feels like we do. The idea of Jesus possessing such diversity and such depth of emotion is too difficult for some people. They just say, I can't, I can't buy that can only imagine a God who's aloof, who doesn't get emotionally involved unless we get into sin. Then he gets mad at us. They imagine an emotional God, but only with anger if we do wrong. They go, he's aloof. You know, he's, ru- he's running the universe. He's very busy. The fact that he likes us, he's ravished. I- I'd like to believe it, but that's, he's not really. He, his anger, his emotions are stirred if I do bad. And I do believe that part. Beloved, let me tell you. The reason... You have emotions that are deep and diverse. is because He does. And we're made in His image. It's not the other way around. Some people say, I don't believe God can have emotions like, like we do. I go, well, that's not exactly true. We have them like He does. It's the other way around. Our capacities come out of His image. Not the other way around. The deep and diverse emotions first exist in the, in the heart of God. We're so used to viewing God through one lens. It's sometimes, and catch this, underline, it takes work to renew our minds to truth. It takes work. Filling your mind with it. Unplugging some of the other things that capture all of our time. Filling our minds. And again, there's, there's a beginning time where it's a little complicated and confusing and it doesn't add up, but you just soak in it. Let one year turn to two and two to five and five to ten and ten to twenty. Let these truths soak in you. And it takes some work, but it's well worth it. Only a diet of pure, undiluted concentrate can heal some of the emotional woundedness and sexual brokenness of the state of the human race. It's going to take a diet of concentrated, undiluted love of God, line after line. And I believe the Lord has the remedy ready and waiting for the earth. Not, it's not only the Song of Solomon. I don't want to present it that way, but God wants to use, take this book off the back shelf and begin to use it right up there along with the book of Romans and the book of Ephesians, the historic central books of the church. Okay, the threefold inheritance. I'll just summarize this first paragraph. David in Psalm 2, a famous messianic psalm, a psalm about the Messiah. That's what I mean by messianic psalm, a psalm about the Messiah. He talks about Jesus' inheritance and he describes it. And I, I don't want to develop Psalm 2 right now. It's one of my favorite psalms. I've preached on it many times through the years. And those of you that are new to the training center, you'll run into it around here. Uh, several are carrying Psalm 2. It's a real favorite to a number of us. But 
David described the inheritance of Jesus as a people who responded to the Lord in three ways. In trembling, rejoicing, and kissing. Psalms 2, verse 11 and 12. These are three sides of our redemption. Trembling, rejoicing, and kissing. Trembling, we tremble by seeing the majesty and splendor of Jesus. As a bridegroom, king, and judge, we tremble before the majesty of the eternal God as a bridegroom, king, and judge. We rejoice by seeing who we are in Christ, by understanding the legal, the practical side of our redemption. We rejoice in discovering the benefits of the cross and how we flow in our giftedness and we serve the community of God. We find our place, we find our giftedness, we find how to do it and we know who we are and the benefits and we love it, we love it. We're happy, we're dancing, we're singing and it's very, very important in the body of Christ. And kissing, that's that emotional, passionate side of our redemption. When our hearts are inflamed by His beauty, we're empowered to walk in the first commandment, kissing. Three significant books of the Bible. Not the only books of the Bible, but the whole Bible touches these subjects in one way or the other. The book of Revelation. These are the three books of the Bible that I have uh, fed uh, on most and related to, to, to this threefold inheritance. The book of Revelation, the majestic eternal side. It will make you tremble. The book of Romans, the legal practical side. The relational side, the, the corporate side of the gospel. The legal, practical, corporate life of the believer. Benefits of the cross. And the number three, Song of Solomon, the passionate emotional side. Now, in history, there was a, a Catholic monk in the 1500s named Martin Luther, lived in Germany. You know it. It's called the Reformation. He received a divine revelation about the legal and the corporate side of our redemption, and he told the whole earth nearly. And his voice was heard through others over the generations. Listen, everybody, you're justified by faith. You stand righteous in God's sight, and every one of you are priests. You can all do, in the, John, in the words of John Wimber, you can all do the stuff. You're priests. You, you all have the ability to operate in the ministry of the kingdom of God, one to another. He talked about the corporate life and the communion table. And God established the book of Romans in a new priority and central place in the body of Christ. I believe globally, and he used this man in that way, the legal corporate side. But Martin Luther, I don't believe he had everything that God has to give. I don't believe that Martin Luther touched the majestic eternal. He did a little bit, the majestic eternal, but just a little bit. But when I read his writings, and I've enjoyed them greatly, it's almost completely devoid of the passionate, emotional side of redemption. And I believe the Lord's saying, I'm going to restore the majestic, eternal, and the passionate, emotional, affectionate side. I will have a people that will rejoice, tremble, and kiss the Son of God. So though I appreciate the Reformation greatly, there's more than Martin Luther brought to center stage. It's not enough to know we're legally free... God wants us to know there's more than the fact that our passport is stamped. He wants to marry us. He says, you're not just accepted. My heart's ravished for you. Oh, accepted is good. Believe me, it begins there. I in no way want to cast even the slightest shadow of doubt in your mind as to the significance, the central place of of the book of Romans. The book of Romans was a book that for 10 years... I couldn't get off the book of Romans for 10 years. All of those in my early ministry used to laugh. I would come Sunday morning again, literally for 10 years, I would say, turn to, and the congregation would say, the book of Romans. I did Romans for years, hard. And then the Lord by no means said, you're done with Romans because it's a reality that you'll live with forever. But then the last 10 years, he said, now I want you to add to your foundation of Romans, the book of Song of Solomon. I want you to add the passion to the legal and the corporate. And right now, in this very last, uh, this very hour, in this last year or two, that's why this is a very personal rendition that I'm laying out here. It's a personal view. The last year or two, the Lord is tugging me in such a strong way to the book of Revelation. And I'm not preaching on it publicly, but for the last nearly two years, I've just been living in the book of Revelation. And I'm beginning to see how Romans, Song of Solomon, and Revelation flow together into one delicious meal before God. And I want to spend 10 years in that. I'm not preaching on Revelation. I touch on it a little here and there. 
but I'm reading it. Typically, uh, we have a, a Friday night watch of the Lord. Typically, every Friday night for the three, four hours, whatever, I will come and I'll just read the whole book, as much of the book of Revelation. I typically devote Friday nights to read as much of the whole book of Revelation every week for about 18 months. And I plan to do that for the next couple of years because I want to add the majestic eternal to the passion and affection to the legal and the corporate because I want to flow in what God's doing to the fullest degree that I can. Now, some of you go, man, I'm a brand new believer. Where do you start? You start one step at a time, inch by inch. You just start where you are right now. Don't, you don't have to have the 30-year program. When I was doing Romans for 10 years, I never even thought of Song of Solomon, not once. I say, well, okay, I'll go do Romans. No, don't do what I did. Do what you do. God didn't call you to be me. You don't have to be like Mike. You can't be like Mike. It doesn't work that way. You have to be you. God has a tailor-made journey for you, for now, that has nothing to do with what I did in 1974. So don't get your eyes on someone else. The Lord's called you here for now, for this hour, for this book, in this class right now. Go for it. Drink deep. Say, well, what? I want my 10 years in Romans. You may get it. You may not. You may find yourself falling into head over heels in the book of Ephesians and Nehemiah or something. Just do what the Lord does to you. I'm just telling you my story. But some young people want to imitate it because they don't have a story yet. Yes, you do. You have a story in the making. Just go with what the Lord puts before you. Typically... Most groups focus on only one of the three sides. And this is uh, something I have a real burden about. Some even go as far as to alienate the other two. We want to be a people who tremble, rejoice, and kiss the sun, right? Oh, we want to tremble before the majesty of God in the book of Revelation. We want to dance with the best of them, don't we? We want to be a dancing church, a dancing people. We want to know... The, the festive spirit and the presence of the Father and the King and to be happy and to, yes! And we want to kiss the Son of God in deep passion and be extravagant lovers that count it our glory to, to lose our life for Him. Some unbalanced holiness groups. There's so many kinds of holiness groups that not all of them are unbalanced, so this isn't a generalized statement against everybody that's focused on holiness as a, uh, as a you know, a, description of their stream in the body of Christ, but some of them are unbalanced, and they seek to tremble before the Lord, but they neglect the elements of rejoicing and kissing. They could be tempted with legalism and a morbid approach to holiness. So I know some holiness people. They, were, they know nothing of rejoicing and kissing. And not all of them, but some of them are tempted with legalism, but morbid. I, I'll just say it a little more frank. They're just, I, I call it cranky holiness. They're just like, they're just like mad all the time, but they imagine they're holy. It's like, ugh. Like, the, you know, some of the Pharisees in their holiness. The, the kids saw them and go, no way. You know, the kids ran the other way. They saw the disciples and they said, eh, maybe, but I doubt it. And they saw Jesus and they ran right into his embrace. I looked at the Pharisees and said, uh-uh. Like the disciples went, no, maybe, but I doubt it. But Jesus, they said, oh, there's something in his eyes of gladness and acceptance. And they went right to his embrace. We don't want to be cranky holiness people. They get tempted with legalism and morbid approach. I, again, this is only some. This is not, I'm not being generalized. Some unbalanced groups that are very common in the body of Christ today, especially within the charismatic side of the church, not only, but especially. They focus on rejoicing, but they neglect trembling and kissing. Oh, they're happy, kind of, but they're carnal. They compromise. It means nothing with them to live a double life. And they go to the party and dance and rejoice. And then there's the other unbalanced groups. Not so many of them today, but through church history. The monastic groups in the medieval times. Some of the Puritan groups in the 17th century. They focused on kissing, on lives of union and abandonment. And they, some of these groups would neglect trembling and regle uh, uh, neglect rejoicing. And they would be, be tempted with unbalanced isolation and unbalanced asceticism. They would do strange things that, that, that were outside of the full counsel of God. Summary, and we end with this. We believe the Spirit of God will provide the sufficient revelation, the release of the power of God in the inner man to equip the bride to live in all three sides of redemption, that we would be the inheritance that Father promised His Son a trembling, rejoicing, kissing bride whose mature bridal partnership pleases the heart of Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's stand.
This is a context for the book. We haven't even looked at the books. But you got kind of a grid for it. I know we covered a lot of territory. I urge you to skip all of Sam's classes and read this and study those books. If Sam flunks you, just say, Sam, what about the affectionate of God's heart and grace? No, you'll get me in big trouble if you do that. I'm just kidding. But my point is, do some unusual things this week, like not spend as much time doing what we normally do, so you can put some time in this, so you, because you only can get as much out of this as you understand. It's in the kind of thing that, again, we're not just kind of trying to create a memory, so a few years from now you can say, wow, that was exciting back then. That's not what this is about. We're not creating a memory. We're setting, spreading a table for you to feast on for the rest of your life. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.